Well, hello again, everyone. This episode of the podcast is sponsored by 101 Hemp, the makers of premium, full-spectrum, raw CBD oil products. And today, I want to talk a little bit about the Raw Relief CBD Topical X. Now, I've been using this more and more since the quarantine because, you know, I've been washing my hands a lot more frequently and my hands start to really dry out. And this stuff really does help keep my hands soft, keep it nice and supple. On top of that, it it's also really good for, you know, just if I need to apply some CBD to any sore muscles, like right on top of them, it's great for that. So go over to 101hemp.org, order yourself some Raw Relief CBD Topical X, and don't forget to use coupon code IMGS25 to get 25% off of that order. All right, now let's start the show. Hermanos y hermanas, brothers and sisters, my fellow cannabis co-conspirators, welcome back. This is the In My Grow Show. I'm your host, Alex, and I want to thank you once again for taking the time to hang out, man. I truly do appreciate it. Now, later on today, I am going to play a conversation that I had once again with Mr. Patrick Goggin. He was cool enough to come back on the show and talk about, well, mostly just answer a lot of um, legal questions that I have about things coming up about cannabis, and that's going to be a little later. But before that, I want to talk to you about a few things. Um, First of all, so Canna Queen is, from Canna Queen Genetics, is starting her own uh, YouTube show. It's going to be called Candid with Canna Queen, I believe. Um, At any rate, she's asked me to co-host with her or, you know, be her second. And that's going to start today, Sunday. What's today's date? The 10th? The 11th? Sunday the 11th of October that starts at um, I believe it's a live show too I believe we're going live that is 9 p.m. Eastern 6 p.m. Pacific so if you can uh, check it out you know for sure now this week I also picked up a little uh, taste tester pack from Sespe Creek Collective that's a dispensary out here in Ojai and they give me a pretty good uh, bag full of goodies to test out let's see the first thing is what is this called canna roadie i guess i'm not sure canna yeah right there i guess right so it says here cannabis infused so social tonic liquid packets and um it is 10 liquid packets each liquid packet has 20 milligrams thc and 40 milligrams cbd and it is the lemon lavender flavor lemon lavender I don't know. So, yeah, that'll be cool to try. I guess it's little um, just packages you put in your drinks. So I'll talk about those some other time. What else did I get? I also got the Sana Sleep Cannabis Infused Capsules. Mm, Let's see. The packaging says total of 20 milligrams. Total cannabinoid 20 milligrams. Um, 3.4 milligrams THC, um, 10 milligrams of CBD, and I think, I don't know, what are they, capsules? Capsules, Mm, I don't know. Again, check that out some other time. What else do we have here? We have, we have, blah, 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 we have a whole flower CBD capsule. Um, who's this from? Don't know who this is from. Oh, right there. Then we also have a whole flower THC capsule, 25 milligrams THC. Hey, I want to know how that's going to make me feel. That's going to be cool. This other one, this is the 30 milligram CBD. Who are they from? Feel the difference with, oh, raw raw flower? Raw brands. Okay. It's from raw brands. All right. So that's cool there. And then we also got uh, 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 some peach ring. Peach rings, live resin batter, <gasps> indica. And this is from peach rings. Is that who made this? West Coast Cure? Oh no, this is West Coast Cure. And I guess peach ring is the flavor. Live resin batter, one gram. Ooh, I'm gonna have to get the nectar collector out for that. I will definitely tell you how that makes me feel. But today, I want to talk about um, this little thing here. This is the. Uh, Dosist. 
It is the Arouse, I guess, the Arouse THC Plus. It is a dose pen, 100 doses, high potency cannabis oil vaporizer. Let's see, and it says here, um, the dose pen is a precision wellness device engineered to deliver an exact 2.5 milligram dose. It's a pretty cool thing. Uh, let me show you. So it comes out, slides out like that. Get your little insert of your directions. You're going to need these directions, okay, to open up. That looks pretty cool, huh? I like the way that looks. To open up this little thing. You see this little thing? It's a little space age thing. Now, it looks. I like the packaging. looks real slick. looks real sexy. You know, nice. But you're supposed to push down on this thing like that, right? Push it down and then slide the clear part out. It is not the easiest thing in the world to do. Um, yeah, uh, good on them. Great design, but fucking A, it's not easy. I mean, it's easier now because I've done it a few times, but... Um, yeah, pretty great for childproof. It's almost adult proof at this point. And then it slides out, fits in there nicely. Dunk, real nicely. Then it slide out, slides out. You get this little vape cartridge pen. This is the mouthpiece. And when you inhale, it turns on automatically. So there's no button, which is really cool because sometimes I'm afraid when I have vape pens or batteries that, um, you know, if you lean on the button too much, it's just going to, you know, people have lit themselves on fire like that, leaning up against that button, keeping it on. Anyways, you don't have that problem with this. As soon as you inhale, it starts going. And then at three seconds, it vibrates to let you know that you've got your two and a half gram hit. That is an awesome thing. Uh, mostly for people like me, because when I get a vape cartridge, I try to hit it with um, like I'm hitting a joint, you know, just as hard as I can. And it just destroys my throat. I'm coughing. It's rough. It sucks. This, that little three-second timer, hey, you, you've already had your 2.5 or three seconds, is an awesome reminder. It's a great thing. This is a really cool product. I liked it. The high was okay. The high was pretty cool. Again, you know, it's it's. <laughs> I found myself trying to um, measure my dosage, like how many hits do I need to feel high, and I, I don't know, I lost count at about six or seven hits. After that, I just got all distracted on reading something I forgot. But anyways, um, really cool product. I liked it. Definitely, uh, I would recommend it, man, especially if you're into vape cartridges um, and just knowing your dose. This is a really good way to know your dose. The only thing I don't know about it now, I, I see it here. I don't know if this comes off. I don't want to start fucking with it and taking it apart because I don't know. It seems like the battery might be a little wasteful. Is there a way to, I don't know, recycle them, send them back to the manufacturer, you know, turn it into just a regular battery? Can you charge it? I don't know these things. I'm going to reach out to Dose. Dose it? Dose it. I'm going to reach out and see what they can tell me. Um, but yeah, if you see it out there, this is pretty cool. This is pretty cool. Um, it's it's a really exact way to measure your, your fucking dose. So right on for them. That's cool. And that is, again, the Dose It. And the flavors, it's a Rouse. And it had a flavor of like a piney lemon, which was okay. Uh, yeah, man, check it out if you see it out there. Um, thanks once again to uh, SSP Creek Collective for passing this along, man. All right, now let's move on to what I've got going on social media-wise. Um, last Saturday, not this past Saturday the 10th, the Saturday before that, I think it was, what, October 2nd or something like that, um, I started a seed giveaway. A lucky winner is going to win two packs of seeds from Canon Queen Genetics. That is the, blah, blah, I want to say the Buttercream Haze and the Queen White Haze. I've got to look at the notes, but I'm almost sure that's what it was. The contest ended yesterday, Saturday the 10th. The winner will be announced on the next episode 127. I have to get all everybody's names together, make sure everyone followed the rules, and then Canon Queen and I are going to pick a winner. And that's going to be announced on show 127. You know, I was supposed to kind of give this announcement last week, but I didn't have a show last week. Things kind of came up, got in the way of that. So, um, well, you know, good luck, everybody. And, uh, yeah, like I said, I will announce that next episode 127. You know, um, <laughs> yeah, so I, I'm, I'm recording in the outside portions of the Buenos Dias Studios, which is basically, you know, my backyard. And it's another beautiful weekend in Ojai. 
so everyone's flying their planes right around their motorcycles and I'm having to record like in between all this noise. Now you ask, well, why don't you record in the house? Uh, because I do have a small house and I have a family that lives in that house with a dog. So it's not as easy as one might think. But anyways, <laughs> um, yeah, just no point to that. Just wanted to bitch about fucking noise. All right, now let's do the strain of the week. And today it's going to be the hazelberry, also known as the hazeberry. Now, this is a sativa dominant cross between the super silver haze and the famous blueberry. And this flower came in today at a 17.5 THC. Uh, to me, the smell was a little piney. It was a little piney, you know, little pine trees with some sugar on top, like some little frosted sugar. That's what it smelled like. The taste was also very similar to that. Um, yeah, a little bit of dirty socks at the end. Not bad. I don't know if it's dirty socks or what that is. But a little, there's a little funk at the end. The high was nice and mellow. You know, it was a 17, so it wasn't really racy. It wasn't, um, you know, just super, super elevated, which was really nice because the come down wasn't also a really heavy crash. You know, it wasn't like nap time, sleepy time. It was a nice, even little kind of flow into sobriety. It was cool. I, I enjoyed it. And the eighth of this cost me about 30, 35 bucks. It was put together by Good Flower. Like I said, not a bad price for the high. It was a 17 and a half, 17.5. But um, now I do have to say one thing that kind of tripped me out, kind of bummed me out. Um, so when I opened it up, the flower was dry, which kind of surprised me. And it surprised me because in the jar, they had one of these humidity packs. You know, it's a 62% humidity. It's put there to just help keep the flower moist as it, you know, hangs out in the packaging. That's why it kind of tripped me out that it was dry. So I went back and checked the other part of the packaging because this jar comes in a box. And it said it was packaged back in June. It is October now. That means that this bud sat in this jar for four months. And I mean, these humidity packs are good, but I don't think they're designed to keep things fresh and moist and supple for four months. Um, so, you know, I mean, who do you blame? Who do I blame? Do I blame the shop? Can't really blame the shop. You know, they they get whatever the distributors get them. You know, it's not like, you know, weeds hanging out on the shelf that long. It might be, but I doubt it. That that shop does a lot of business. I'm not going to call out the shop. You know, who cares? Um, you know, I can't really blame the farmer. I can't really blame good flower. You know, they they did a great job growing that flower. They put it together. You know, it's, it's I think it's the system that California's in. You know, the distributor... Well, for a couple of reasons, you know, maybe the distributor hung on to it too long. And there's a reason why distributors hang on to it so long. One is because, one major reason is because there's very, there's not that much shelf. As far as sales shelf, as far as cannabis, legal cannabis shops. So if the distributor has a bunch of products and very limited shelf space to put it on, he's going to wind up hanging on to it or she or they're going to wind up hanging on to it, you know, for a while. So, fuck, man, who do I blame for getting, you know, dry weed in my hands? You know what? I blame the regulatory. You know, I think if they, if I think if we had more legal shops, I think if more municipalities, more cities allowed legal shops, this wouldn't be a problem. You know, I wouldn't get four-month-old weed. So, you know, there it is. Um, yeah. You know, I don't know what to tell you about this, um... Hazel Berry, you know, it seems like it was a victim of timing. It's a good flower. I liked it. Don't get me wrong. I liked it. It was a good flower. It just bummed me out that it was dry. But anyways, um, yeah, that's that's the strain of the week, man. That's the review. All right, let's move on to the report from the Cannabis Frontline. Let's see. Today, we're going to start off with uh, Normal. That is normal.org. Go over there, get involved, become a member. And the title to this article is Hawaii Governor Legalizes Sales of Edible Products by Licensed Medical Cannabis Dispensaries. It says here, the legislation bill 2097 allows licensed dispensaries to manufacture and distribute edible cannabis products. Though enacted some two decades ago, Hawaii's medical cannabis law has previously not allowed for dispensaries to engage in the sales of cannabis infused edible products. Wait, what? So Hawaii's had a medical cannabis program for two decades? I didn't know that. That's a trip. 
but they're barely now allowing edibles. Well, good. That's good. I'm not going to judge the fact that they're just allowing edibles, whatever, how long it took them. I'm, I'm just glad that they're allowing edibles. Good for them. That's going to be cool, but as, um, let's see, let's go on. It also says the new law will also, for the first time, permit dispensaries to provide, disseminate, and publish educational and scientific material related to medical cannabis and its approved products and sponsored events about medical cannabis. Well, that's good. Wait, so they weren't allowed to talk about the benefits of cannabis before? Am I understanding that right? Well, that's a good thing, but that's still a trip that they would have it for two decades, but weren't allowed to really talk about how good it was for people or how it could help people in certain conditions, with certain conditions. Um, well, all in all, it's a good thing. Let's see. And the article ends by saying, Governor Ig signed the measure into law earlier this month. The new law takes effect January 1, 2021. Okay, January 1st, everybody in Hawaii, you can now get edibles and you can um, get some education at the same time at the dispensaries. And the next article also comes from Normal. It uh, comes from Pennsylvania. Federal judge says fired worker can sue after being terminated for use of medical cannabis. Hey, that's a good thing. A judge for the District Court of the Eastern District of Pennsylvania has determined that the medical cannabis patient may pursue legal action against her former employer after she was terminated for failing a job-related drug test. There you go. Good for Pennsylvania, man. You fail a drug test if you're a patient. Um, or wait, is it medical? Yes, if you're a patient, uh, doesn't sound like you're allowed to be fired for failing a drug test. Goes on to say the judge denied the motion by the employer Thomas Jefferson University Hospital Inc. to dismiss to dismiss the plaintiff's suit. The plaintiff, a former security analyst for the company, registered with the state's medical cannabis access program while recovering from a spinal surgery. She was subjected to a drug screen upon her return to work and was fired after testing positive for the previous use of cannabis. For the previous use of cannabis. Wow, so trip out. So the hospital that she works at, she works at a medical hospital, um, drug tested her after she got back from spinal surgery. And while she was recovering from spinal surgery, she had registered as a medical cannabis patient. So when she came back, they tested her. She came back positive for cannabis and they fired her. And the judge said, you know what? Um, that's not allowed. And she is suing her employer. So good for the judge. Good for Pennsylvania. That's going to be cool. I'm going to follow that to see um, how that ends up for her, man. That's awesome. Now, the last story comes out of the Cannabis Business Times, and it's entitled California Cannabis Banking Bill Becomes Law. And it was put together by Eric Sandy. Says a new California law will provide safe harbor for banking institutions doing business with cannabis companies. It also makes it far easier to start this process for both the banks and the businesses than ever before. Essentially, the law states that financial services and bank institutions are not acting criminally when they engage with a licensed cannabis business. By virtue of the license, that business is operating legally within the state of California. This clears up fundamental issues that persists in the age of federal prohibition. So that's really good for the uh, cannabis industry here in California, man. I know that's always been a struggle, not just for the cannabis industry here, but in other states because of the federal legality of cannabis. Um, the thing that this article is recommending companies do is, since it is legal in the state, to look for financial institutions that are just simply in the state, like uh, of credit unions, you know, or re really local community banks. Because it's from what the article says, it sounds like um, companies are running into problems when they try to get financial help from financial institutions that are nationwide, you know, because they have this really broad federal kind of national uh, uh, policy about cannabis. Whereas since your institution or your small, you know, credit union institutions are local, they're in state. They have an easier time, I guess, getting the paperwork through or getting loans, but that's awesome. Um, good for California, good for them for passing that law. And, and again, that's also cool because, you know, it props up your local state economy. 
And that, brothers and sisters, is the report from the Cannabis Frontline. As always, there are links in the show notes so you can read these at your leisure and then send me an email. Let me know what you think. All right, now, next, I'm going to play that conversation that I had with Patrick Goggin. He was nice enough once again to come back on the show and, you know, really just um, talk to me about all the legal mumbo jumbo going on in cannabis and hemp. I really do love talking to that guy. He's really zen about things, you know, because me, I'm real just just emotional about things, especially when it comes to cannabis. You know, I get really frustrated with how slow things take and, and, and um, yeah, you know, he does a really good job of kind of reeling it in and say, look, yeah, you can get emotional and mad about it, but you still got to work within these systems. Uh, so, yeah, man, Patrick, you know, really thankful he had the time to, to come on and uh, talk about just different things. Again, we talked about um, Delta H, THC. Oh, I didn't know what Delta H was. Huh? Yeah, it's another cannabinoid that is psychoactive. It isn't in the same like quantities as Delta 9, but um, it's still out there. We also talked a little bit about, you know, the differences between legalization and decriminalization, you know, because Biden wants to decriminalize. And I'm like, fuck, dude, that's not far enough. So he was cool. Talked about that, man. Um, yeah. Patrick Goggin. Uh, give me a few minutes. I'm going to play it, a little bit of music and I'm going to put that on for you. So check it out, everyone. I have with me Patrick Goggin, again on the show, who is a lead attorney at the Hoban Law Group. Patrick, brother, welcome back to the show, man. Thank you for taking the time to come on once again. It's good to be here, Alex. Uh, it's been a little bit of a little bit of time. We're we're a few months further along into this pandemic. Um, we're all getting a little fatigued by it, but just you know, a shout out to everybody to hang in there and. Uh, stay the course. Yeah, uh, you, we last time we spoke it was like at the beginning, or I don't know, maybe a first couple months into the quarantine. But a lot's happened in in cannabis and CBD and hemp since then. You know, I mean, uh, for one, yeah, the world, yeah, spinning. you know, yeah, things to, things still keep, has to have to be taken care of. You know, for one, first we all got excited because you know the government came out and said, hey, we're going to vote on the Moore Act, and then like ten days later they're like, no, not really. We're going to wait till after the election, which uh, kind of annoyed me, mostly because, I don't know, man, it seemed kind of a little bit of a bait and switch just because Harris was one of the main, you know, sponsors of that. Anyways, man, so that got canceled. Um, but a lot of other things have happened, still keep going on. You know, um, let's first talk about what was AB 2028 and how that kind of affected um, hemp. Because as I understand it, part of AB, part of that 2028 was that hemp products were going to be allowed in cannabis storefronts. And that pretty much just died. Why, how, how did that? Uh... Well, there, there was a lot more to 2028. Uh, and th it was really a, a continuation of uh, AB 228 uh, from the prior year. And what the, you know, the principal intention and objective of this legislation is to declare hemp extracts and CBD not to be an adulterant. A number one, it's not an adulterant. Okay, so now it's it's not prohibited. What do you mean by an and it's what do you mean by an well, adulterant? What is that? Basically, uh, an adulterant means um, it's a, it's a term that the FDA uses uh, for you know, human consumed food and, and oral products that were, that were taking and that, that they just, they're basically saying, you know, it's, it's, it's not allowed. We don't, we're not clear on its safety and uh, it's, you know, otherwise unlawful. And there's, there's, there's no legality around For people it. to start. However, as we, as we know, it was all made lawful under the 2018 Farm bill and 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 the FDA recognizes that, but before they go and and you know engage or complete rulemaking, they're doing all this these studies and trying to gather safety data. Um, you know their charge is consumer protection, and and we're not going to get into um, their hypocrisy and their inconsistency on applying their charge. 
but at the same time, you know, that's that's what they're they're charged with, and and so uh, at least from from their vantage point, that's kind of the you know, what they're trying to achieve is safety for the consumers, and therefore until they uh, recognize and understand uh, how many, how much should be allowed in serving sizes and so forth and who should be allowed to have it, that they're going to continue to say that it's an adulterant. And, and here in the state of California, the Department of Public Health has extended their position into the state as they're a, an extension of the FDA. So what, what we were trying to do in, in 2028 and 228 is it's not an adulterant. It's going to be regulated by the Department of Public Health. And therefore, we're going to have we're going to have uh, our the producers, the extractors, and the manufacturers get licensed as food processing facilities, and go under the auspices of CDPH uh, uh, jurisdiction and, and regulation, and and therefore protect consumers. And that would have been a seismic event. Yeah, it really would have changed the 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 landscape of um, not just the cannabis industry, but the hemp and the CBD industry as well. Yeah, and so one of the components of the bill was also to create a um, pathway for uh, these these hemp uh, cannabinoids and, and really non-THC cannabinoids to get into uh, cannabis products and, and, and that retail market. And, and that effort was um, basically trumped at the end of the session when... Uh, the legislation got caught up in a you know, political battle between the Senate and the Assembly and involves the, the administration on other legislation uh, that, that had nothing to do with this. But we got caught up in that battle and, and, and that fight. And, and it's a real shame. Uh, but, it, but it happened primarily because the administration did not engage until mid-August, and the session ended at the end of August. So we had basically two weeks to sprint to the finish line, and, and we got caught up in California politics. So do we have to wait another year to put that proposition forward again? Or, or... Well, we do have to wait until the, the uh, legislature reconvenes in its new session in the beginning of uh, 2021. Uh, it actually starts a whole new uh, two-year process whereby uh, you have legislation that doesn't make it through in the first year can, can become a two-year bill. Um, but this is a case or, or a piece of legislation that really has urgency. And uh, the we, we've had a lot of conversations, a lot of negotiations with the administration on it. And I, and I have you know, strong confidence and, and optimism that that this bill moves early in the session and and hopefully it doesn't take till till august to to get a deal done um and and there's a piece of the legislation that's important that, that it is uh it does have an urgency clause so it would go into immediate effect um but we yeah we because it didn't pass uh this session we have to wait till the till the next one unfortunately but we can continue to you know, work on the issue to, to educate uh, legislators and, and address some of the ways that 2028 just wasn't what we wanted. You know, there was some, a lot of negotiating that occurred uh, at the end, and, and one of the, the, the issues that cropped up was smokable hemp. And What was the hang-up with the smokable hemp? Do they just associate that too closely to, like, smokable cannabis? I mean... I just don't. I, well, I mean, you know, I think in part the there is there is some some law enforcement concern of not being able to tell the difference between the two, uh, in in, right. in in the, in the sure. smell. But but it's more than that. It's it's more than that, and I don't think, and that's just not a, su a sufficient excuse. It's who's going to regulate it, and you know, we we were we were forcing. Basically, we were forcing CDPH to the table. They're an extension of the FDA. They didn't want to be at the table, but 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 we'd done our work. We the administration did its work and got them to the table. Um, you know, as an extension of the FDA, they have quite they have, they have paused for that because they haven't gotten their arms wrapped around the national level. Well, the national spotlight was shifted to California, and and had we 
pass that legislation, you know, we would have been moving mountains. We are doing that here in California, and we will get back at it again. But but getting back to the smokable hemp, it was, it was really about CDPH not wanting to take on that authority. They don't they don't regulate those products generally. We haven't seen the FDA get even even start to get really too far down the road on regulating vape products, right? And so I think it's just limited bandwidth and limited uh, capacity, and and uh, it, it can only happen through forcing it. And so we're going to continue at it. And, and it may be that, that the there's a different agency that we need to deal with, like uh, the Bureau of uh, Tobacco and Alcohol. Well, and see, and that's another thing that I, that seemed like um, 2028 was going to kind of address was also consolidating some of these departments. You know, I mean, because the Department of Public Health just taking so long, or just not even, I don't know, taking the time, or they they don't have they don't have the staff to look into it. It's just, yeah, that's why uh, I was kind of surprised and kind of bummed, but hopefully. You know, um, like you said, it goes forward in the next legislative session. Yeah, we, I mean, here, here's the thing, and, I, and this is a good way to characterize the progress that we made. In June, we felt that there was a 10% chance of getting legislation through. By, by mid-August, that chance had increased to 50%. Oh, nice. That, that... By, by towards the end of August, we were thinking that we had crossed the finish line. And but for the squabbles between the parties, we think we would have been there. So we, we made um, significant progress. And, you know, I, I, you just got to remember that legislation in the state of California is incredibly challenging. And it, you just rarely get uh, bills passed without multiple efforts. And by way of example, in this context, our hemp farming statute in the state um, faced three vetoes between 2006 and 2011 before we finally got to a signature in 2013. So my call out to folks is buck up, get back on the horse, and continue the charge towards progress. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, we're not giving up, that's for sure. Um, no but way. Now, now, another piece of <laughs> murky regulation that came out um, is the DEA's regulation on how they're going to oversee CBD concentrates or hemp extracts because a lot of the unchecked boxes, well, one of the main unchecked boxes in that regulation that I saw was the fact that they weren't really talking about how they're going to deal with the actual concentrations that the producers hold while they're producing it. Because the way I read it, and I'm not a lawyer, I'm just me, it seems it sounds like the DEA could just bust into any producer and just take all their product because it's at that point to where it's extraction and you're separating it or isolating it. Look, all I can say is this is what DEA does. They run interference. They're an obstructionist agency and they don't want to see hemp continue to make progress. And so, yeah, like, so we're dealing with having to make progress with the FDA. And, and while we thought we got rid of the DEA because the, the 2018 farm bill is very specific and it says the agencies that have jurisdiction over hemp are the U.S. Department of, of Agriculture and the um, FDA, not the DEA. And that the DEA had to go change its rules to remove hemp and its definitions to remove hemp from its jurisdiction. The problem with the DEA is they're a federal agency that is re relies upon appropriations and funding and therefore relevant. And as, as hemp and cannabis continue to make strides towards normalization, hemp actually has fully made strides toward, towards normalization, They'll, they're going to do anything they can to um, continue to have the issue be confusing to the public and not just the public, but policymakers and, you know, as they continue to fight for budget. So this is... Um, Yet another example of historical DEA overreach when it comes to hemp. It started in, in 2000 uh, when the ONDCP directed the DEA to uh, promulgate rules, adopt rules that would make the human consumption of hemp illegal because it had trace, because it has trace quantities of THC in it. 
the industry filed a, filed a challenge in the Ninth Circuit challenging those rules, not just not once, but twice. And we won twice. And, and since that time, you've had the Ninth Circuit coin for the first time, non-psychoactive hemp, which is fully lawful under both the Marijuana Tax Act and the Controlled Substances Act. And the court ruled that way and told the DEA that if you want to continue to do what you're doing, then you need to go engage in a scheduling action. And you haven't, engaged, you haven't performed the proper procedures to do that. Therefore, you cannot enforce these rules. They did this again in 2016 with the marijuana extract rule, when they basically did not distinguish between hemp and marijuana and saying that any you know, concentration of cannabinoids is a controlled substance. The industry has fought back on DEA overreach time and time again and continued to prevail. Now, what is the DEA doing here? They're saying, similar to in, in 2001, that they're merely passing what's called an interpretive rule, meaning it's, it's not a legislative rule. It doesn't have the force of law. It, it's just their, their interpretation of what the law says. So they don't have to go through notice and comment, and, and, and they don't have to do anything other than to say this is what is so. Well, but what they're saying is, is that based on the definition of hemp under the Farm Bill, that anything that goes above 0.3% THC, no matter at what point in the process of manufacturing, because of that 0.3% THC limitation in the definition, that applies to everything, no matter where you are in the process, including extracts. And therefore, if, if any uh, extract rises above uh, 0.3% at any point along the way, then it is a controlled substance, at least at that time. So you have crude and all kinds of extract out there sitting in people's warehouses that is by DEA argument, a controlled substance. Even though it's not going into finished product, it doesn't matter to them. It's They're taking a literal reading of that definition, and they're saying that that material becomes a controlled substance. At that and, and that's the fear of the, of the producers, of the processors, is that in that chain of events, when they still have chain of custody, because they're producing it, they're extracting it, they're you know, trying to get the balance right, that the DEA can come in and just shut them down. They can. That doesn't mean that they right. Can. Right. Well, that doesn't mean that they that they are necessarily. And this is again part of um, DEA's and you know the federal government's and U.S. attorneys' um, strategy, oftentimes Department of Justice, where they they they'll they'll issue a rule or like the FDA, they'll they'll send out a, a warning letter, and and then they won't do anything beyond that. And then and they 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 their intention is is that you know they go after the low-hanging fruit, and that it, it sends a chill through the industry and that that affects further activities and operations. Not that they really have to do anything much beyond that. Well, rule. sure, because... But at the same time, but at the same time, you have companies out there that rely upon the law and, and being compliant with the law, and now folks are put in a position where they have to make a choice between in, continuing to engage in their business, which is fully lawful, and and deal with or or seize those operations out of fear of the DEA's enforcement. Yeah, it almost sounds like um, they're expecting everybody to self-police out of fear, and that's going to really slow down the industry. Um, right. That's you know, and that, and that and that's just that is the historic. That's the historical context within which we lie here today and, and with this D, uh, DEA's IFR. We're preparing for further action in the district court to litigate this issue and seek relief from the courts. And, and I'll say, I'll just say to your, your listeners that we would, you know, we're, we, we've set up a legal defense fund for this and we'd appreciate any, any contributions that can be made. Go to hemplegaldefensefund.com uh, and pitch in and, and help us do our part 
in protecting the industry. Now, um, there are some uncertain financial times for some folks. Is there a way they can get onto like a letter writing campaign as well in case they can't help with funds or some way to volunteer? Uh, spread the well. They could. I mean, really spread the word. Get the word out. Distribute it. Get it out on social media. Spread. Um, you know, share that link and um, you know, go do a help us do a fun, GoFundMe campaign. I know people. Money's tight. We get it, but not not for everybody. The cannabis industry uh, sure is. Uh, there, it's not in recession. So the mo- there's money out there. Yeah, for cannabis companies, you know, they they were deemed essential. You know, so there, it's not like they shut down. Uh, so now nope. I want to talk to you a little bit about some fringe stuff only because so if I read me, if, if when I read the uh, 2018 um, farm bill, some of the language in there says that all cannabinoids extracted from hemp are not part or are not to be listed as part of the CSA, the Controlled Substance Act. And some of us take that as meaning, well, then, you know, there is Delta-8 THC that's out there. It's not at, at, and the same um, percentages as Delta-9, but it's still in the plant and it's still psychoactive. And they think, well, hey, this is a great workaround because it's legal. But that's not exactly how it's worked or that's not exactly how it's enforced, though, is it? Well, and, and, and also, I mean, I think that, you know, t- technically that's right. Uh, however... Folks should know that this new DEA IFR in our final rule again, it includes this position that synthetic uh, tetrahydrocannabinols are are prohibited, and and delta eight is uh, perceived as that. So uh, the rule is trying to extend to uh, delta eight and, and other synthesized cannabinoids. But let's talk about delta eight for a minute. Um, because folks need to be cautious. Delta-8, from my understanding, is a psychoactive compound. Therefore, if folks are either consuming it or uh, putting it into the marketplace, they need to be prepared for that and sufficiently warn folks about the potential um, effects of of this product that they are going to be intoxicated yeah i mean this is this is um something you do not want to take lightly and i don't think that it's uh, does a service to our community to um not educate consumers and make sure that folks understand the products that they're buying yeah, um, yeah, especially because there's not a lot really known about how Delta-8 affects us. I mean, we do know it's a psychoactive. Yes, it'll get us high. But other than that, there's, I mean, very little that we know. Right, so proceed cautiously. Yeah, for sure, man. Um, hey, one other thing. So <clears throat> I, I want to ask you if you could explain to us, I don't know if we've already talked about this or not about really what the differences are between legalizing cannabis and decriminalizing Mm -hmm. cannabis because Joe Biden, you know, part of the cannabis sector got real excited when Joe Biden came out and said, hey, I'm going to decriminalize cannabis. Um, I don't think personally that's a solution because you're still putting people in the system. People are still... Yeah, and I think that's a pretty pretty one of the strong distinctions there and you know i think we look at the state of california for examples um proposition 215 created defenses for a medical defense for for cannabis that was not legalizing cannabis that was effectively decriminalizing medical cannabis right so it did it didn't at the state level it didn't say medical cannabis is Ill, is is legal it said that uh folks had a defense against criminal prosecution for the medical use of cannabis that is very different from legalizing something which prop 64 did it said that this is 
fully lawful within the state, and and we've deemed it so, and we are going to create uh, you know, the, the BCC, the Bureau of, of uh, Cannabis Control, an agency to regulate it and to issue license licenses so that people can lawfully conduct business sanctioned by the state and 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 not subject themselves to state criminal enforcement. So those are those are big differences, um, and but but at the same time, you know, when it comes to the normalization of cannabis, you, you know, and, and particularly at the federal level, um, it, it it occurs in in steps. You you take baby steps, and and so I don't fault uh, Biden for for saying that you know we're going to take it one step at a time. It just. Because this is, you know, this is a major policy shift over the past 80 years, and we are going to do it methodically. I mean, yeah, I can see that point. I, I, I'm, uh, man, I just don't agree with the whole incrementalist of it, though. You know, I mean. Well, you know, I think, you know, I, I tend to, part of me agrees with you, but at the same time, uh, you know, I, I'm a realist through experience, and it's just the way things go and, and, and maybe it's, it shouldn't be so, but sometimes we have to, um, recognize the realities and push within the system to make changes there. And I, I've been doing it for 30 years. I mean, that's what, that's why I set out on the path that I did. And trust me, I have been bucked off that horse and so frustrated so many times that, the changes haven't been implemented and, and, and made. And I thought, you know, back in uh, 1990, I saw hemp fields in our, uh, in the Central so Valley. Were you, do you think I, do you think I thought it was going to take 30 what? years? So no. are you still having the same arguments and conversations for the past 30 years? I mean, is it all just, is, well, look, uh, is it mean, all I mean, just look, education? I, I, that, uh, yeah, it just seems like a long well, it's, time. It, 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 it's both it's both education and, and recreation or or the creation of new systems, and that's what we're doing. I mean, that's the thing. It's like when when what other example in our lifetimes do you have of something that has been stigmatized throughout our entire lives, you know, and propaganda presented for our entire lives that something is criminal and then not, it, it it goes not into just criminal but legality but immoral you know well yeah, yeah. but i mean no, right. let's okay. just say incarcerating sure. we're incarcer we're taking people's freedom away for it and 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 today in california we're releasing people i mean the, i agree with you that the incremental approach is hard to stomach but at the same time i will i will just say Moving mountains takes time. Yeah, I mean, you're right. I mean, uh, yeah. I'm of two minds, man. It's taking too long. Too many people are still, I mean, because I, 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 the thing I, I always come around to, and, you know, we're, we're both there is the fact that here in California, people are, you know, making money, starting businesses. There's an industry, and there are people in Kentucky still in prison for 30 years because of it. It's just, uh, I don't know, man. It just... I wish it would go faster, really. Um, you know. I, 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 I do, too. I do, too. I, I guess what I'm trying to do is, is, is provide just some perspective on the realities, whether we like those realities or not. You know, I, 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 that's not my point. The point is, is, is I just want to provide some encouragement and, and for, for folks to stay on the path and, and, and to stay confident and that we'll we'll get there and and to keep at it to not lose faith. So, do you know like where the states act is that right now? I mean, is that even spoken about in certain circles anymore? Well, I mean, certainly, but here's the thing: is like I just I have had I don't have confidence in in our policymakers inside the beltway when it comes to changing cannabis policy. Um, it's, it's a result of the war on drugs. 
and this law and order mentality and the law enforcement lobby that we, that we faced here in the state of California for so long. I mean, that was who we were going up against. And, and it was really difficult to swallow and stomach the, the onslaught of misinformation and, and um, campaign against progress. But it exists. These forces exist. They're well-funded. They've been well-funded for a long time. So we need we need a sea change in in uh, D.C. and God willing, we'll get it in November. Yeah, hopefully that's what we're hoping for, huh? Uh, hey, Patrick, I appreciate you taking the time, brother, getting on the phone with me, um, clearing some stuff up, and just let, you know, just letting me vent at just the the fucking legality of it all, you know. Um, <laughs> hey, you know, Alex, I, I always enjoy speaking with you and enjoy our time together and, you know, just want to continue to encourage everybody to to stay the course and, and stay positive and, and upbeat during these really difficult and challenging times and stay healthy. Oh, thanks a lot, man. Yeah, for sure. Hey, uh, so do me a favor. Tell everyone where they can find you and then remind everyone again about that, um, how they can help the hemp. What was that project you got? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so you can find me at, at Patrick at Hoban.law, common spelling Patrick, P-A-T-R-I-C-K, at H-O-B-A-N dot law. You can also uh, check out Hoban.law's website. Um, but in, importantly and significantly, if you, if you or anybody knows you know that can can uh, contribute. We've got uh, this legal hemp legal defense fund website and PayPal portal uh, for contributions to the fund. It's hemplegaldefensefund.com, and really appreciate any support you might have or just spreading the word to folks. We we're we're, we're doing uh, good work for the industry, working to protect it, and uh, need all the support we can get. Right on, brother. Thank you very much. Um, so, don't hang up. Okay, everybody else, I'm going to play a little bit of music, and I'm going to be right back. Well, everyone, I hope that helped clarify a few things, um, legally-wise, anyways, with cannabis in California. Again, I want to thank Patrick Goggin for taking the time and coming back on the show, man. I truly do appreciate that. And as always, if you have a question or a comment about this episode, uh, send us an email. That is in mygrow at gmail.com. And I want to take this time to thank all of you for subscribing to the podcast, subscribing to the website, subscribing to the YouTube channel. We truly do appreciate that. And don't forget, if you want to support the show financially, you can go over to inmygrow.com, click on the support the show tab. You can buy a t-shirt over there. So do me a favor, subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen to a podcast and then leave a rating and a review. Subscribe to the website inmygrow.com. Then subscribe to the YouTube channel that is youtube.com slash inmygrowshow. Then after you all that subscribing, do me one more favor and just tell three other people about the show. Real simple, real easy. Now, if you are a cannabis company, the most inexpensive way to keep in contact with your audience, to keep in contact with your fans, to let the public know what services and products you've got coming out, advertise on the In My Grow show. Send us an email. That is inmygrow at gmail.com. And before I forget, I also want to thank all of the artists who let me use their music to put this show together. And just another reminder, go over to 101hemp.org, order yourself some premium full-spectrum raw CBD oil products, And use coupon code IMGS25 to get 25% off of that order. All right, brothers and sisters. Well, I am going to get on out of here. You know I love you all very much. And remember to always grow, learn, and teach. Mm